<laughs> wow, that was weird. It was just like there was no sound. That's crazy. Just kidding. I wasn't actually talking. But I'll bet you could tell a lot about what I might have been saying if there had been sound. And that is the power of nonverbal communication. Hello there. It's me, Patrick, here once again with a video lecture covering concepts from Corey Floyd's Interpersonal Communication. This week is all about nonverbal communication. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is going to be a long video, so are you well rested? Do you have enough food and water to last you through the end of this video? Do you have anywhere to be in the next uh, two to three days? No? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, then let's jump in. Today's topic is the 10 channels of nonverbal communication. <laughs> okay, the first channel of nonverbal communication is facial displays. Now, our faces tell a lot about us. Uh, first, it's how we tell each other apart. That is, our face is the number one way that people identify each other. I look at you, I recognize your face, and I place a name with it. Bob, right? Bob? No? Oh, uh, my bad. <laughs> anyway, identity is huge. Another way that faces make a difference is in our measure of attractiveness. For the most part, we find symmetrical and proportional faces to be more attractive. Now, this isn't necessarily true for every single person. Just ask my wife. Even though I have a fairly asymmetrical face, uh, see this birthmark uh, here? It doesn't match anything on the other side of my face. So, my face would not be considered attractive by most societal standards. Yet, my wife claims that I'm a hottie. And she is a hottie, <laughs> so I've got that going for me. <laughs> the third function of facial displays is emotion. Uh, we show how happy or sad or angry or well, really almost any emotion through our face. And there are other ways we show emotion, but that's one of the biggest. So let's change channels. <laughs> no? Okay. And move on to eye behaviors. Now, obviously, the eyes are in our face, but they are not their, have their own channel because they tell so much. The technical term for the study of eye behavior is oculesics. How do you like my uh, fancy graphics? Huh? Huh? Yeah? No? Okay. Eye behavior includes whether we make eye contact with another person or not, as well as our pupil size. We obviously control our eye contact, but rarely can people control pupil size. As you'll see, we don't always control all of our nonverbal behavior. Some of it is immutable. Now that was an easy one. How about the next channel? Movement and gestures. The study of movement and gestures is called kinesics. There are five types of movements and gestures. Of course, these are in the textbook, but let me show a few to you. First, we have emblems. These are gestures that have a direct verbal translation. For example, waving in our culture means either hello or goodbye. Uh, the next type of gesture is called illustrators. These are gestures that go along with something you're saying in order to clarify your message. So if I was talking about how big that spider is right behind you, I would say it's about hmm, that big. It's cool that you have a pet spider. Not my thing, though. Next are affect displays. These are gestures that communicate some kind of emotion. So if I was really excited, I might do a fist pump. Yeah! Mm. Next are regulators. That's when I try to control the flow of conversation. So I might ask students in my class, uh, my face-to-face -face class, to raise their hands. That's a regulator. And finally, adapters. This is when we use a gesture to take care of some personal need, like scratching my ear or taking a sticky note that is stuck to your shirt. That's so, uh, that's so uh, weird. Um, uh, just let me... Huh. That's odd. Huh. Okay, moving on. The next channel of nonverbal communication is MTV! <laughs> Just kidding. MTV isn't a channel anymore. Is it? Anyway, the next channel of nonverbal communication is touch behaviors or haptics. Um, just like with movements, we have five types. Affectionate touch, hugs and kisses and stuff like that. <laughs> Caregiving touch, the kind of touch that a nurse or doctor might do. Power and control touch. Uh, this would be if uh, you needed to guide somebody somewhere. Oh, for example, 
If you were standing in the middle of a narrow hallway, having a conversation, not caring that people are trying to get by, just standing there, I might eventually have to gently touch you on the back to move you out of the way. <laughs> All better now. <laughs> oh, the next type of touch is aggressive touch. This would be like, you know, hitting somebody. Um, let's not do that, huh? Finally, would be ritualistic touch. Uh, this is usually cultural. For example, if we shake hands upon meeting or departing, that's a ritualistic touch. Okay, enough touching. Let's move on to our next nonverbal channel. This one is called vocal behavior. There's nine. Count them. Nine types of vocal behavior. I'm just going to list these and pick out a couple that are interesting to me. The nine are pitch, inflection, volume, rate of speech, um, filler words, pronunciation, articulation, accent, and silence. My favorite, silence, ah, silence. Wait, 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 wait. Now, how can silence be a frickin' nonverbal form of vocal behavior? Think about it. The lack of talking says just as much as the talking sometimes. Uh, think about a time when you had a fight with a sibling or a parent or a significant other. Maybe one of you gave the other the silent treatment. Silence can speak volumes. All right, we're at the halfway point of the nonverbal channels. The next five are actually a little shorter, so you are more than halfway through the video. But I could use a break. I think you should take a break too, so go ahead and pause the video. I'm going to grab some water and come right back. Okay, are you back? Good. Uh, the sixth of the nonverbal channels is smell. What? Smell? Is that right? Uh, what? Uh, touch? Um, vocal behavior? Right. <gasps> Yeah, it says it right here. Uh, page 198. <laughs> so, okay. I, I don't know if I entirely agree with this one. Maybe they just wanted to have a nice even 10 channels, and they're like, hmm, um, <gasps> fingernails? No, um, <gasps> ooh, earwax! No. <gasps> ooh, smell! <sighs> But okay, let's go with it. Floyd tells us that smell, also known as olfactics, can influence our reactions to others, specifically in memories and sexual attraction. So the other day, I was walking through campus and they were putting fresh mulch down. And that smell reminded me of my childhood growing up in Vermont. Lots of cows around, you know? Uh, so yeah, I guess. But, but I don't quite know how that is communication. And sexual attraction, well, there is a ton of research about how different scents create attraction. And I guess if you were trying to use a certain scent to create a certain reaction, that could be communication. Okay, I I'm okay with this again. Moving on to a less controversial channel, we have the use of space. Study of personal space is called proxemics. There was an anthropologist named Edward Hall who defined four spatial zones. There are... There is intimate distance, like less than a, f like a foot and a half feet from a person. I call that the hit or kiss zone. Then we have personal distance, which is about one and a half to four feet. Those are like, you know, friends and relatives. Then we have social distance, about four to 12 feet. This is at stores and walking around campus. We give each other space. Finally, there's public distance. This is between 12 and 25 feet. And usually when we're giving speeches or presentations to groups of people, now, where we stand does communicate a lot. Uh, try this out. Go to a public food court or cafeteria. Go to a table that has other people at it, but at least one empty chair. Sit in a chair right next to a perfect stranger. That's going to be awkward because of our relationship with space, and hopefully you won't get hit. Um, so anyway, um, be careful. Oh, the next channel is called Physical Appearance. It includes what we are wearing. This beautiful checkered shirt. Nice! 
It also includes our hairstyle, any jewelry or tattoos we might have. It also includes some things beyond our control, our height, for example. Our weight is also part of our physical appearance. All of these say something about us. Uh, sometimes those messages are out of our control, but we do get the opportunity to set impressions with those things we do control, like what we wear or how we style our hair. I'm going for the crazy professor look, can you tell? The next channel of nonverbal communication is called chronemics, or the way people use time. Now, uh, how we spend time sends a clear message. If we choose to work on homework instead of going out with our friends, we are sending a message that our school is more important than our friends. At least, that's the message our friends might get. That's why I believe we should be very aware of the choices we make with our time. Choice management, mind you, not time management. And the final channel of nonverbal communication is the use of artifacts. What's an artifact? All of the stuff around us. Uh, the stuff we keep on our walls. The stuff we keep on our desks. Uh, the stuff we keep in our cars. The colors on the walls of the places where we live. All of this communicates something. I mean, look around. I clearly have a crazy, eclectic office. Uh, style. But ultimately, it's me. And I like that. Hmm. Woo that was a lot of sh stuff to talk about. I hope you got all of that. I mean, if you didn't, it's okay. I talk fast. You know, you can rewind and stuff. Well, that's it for this video. I hope the rest of your week is amazing. <sighs> Bye!